see the wheels going around on the tape recorder. And then I only had about 10 minutes of tape and I ran back out and brought this tape recording back. And I like to think I can remember that moment when I played that recording back. And I was, you know, as you well know, I was taken to another world, a world where none of us can ever be because our behavior would influence it and distort it. And I was just fascinated by what I heard. Because when birds are feeding, it's they're under quite a lot of stress because they've got their heads down. and So there's lots of contact calls and sounds that we're not generally aware of. So I was just fascinated by that process. And then it liberated me to think, because this record had batteries in it, I could take it outside. So we lived on the edge of Derbyshire in the Peak District. So as I started to go out as a young teenager, I started to take this tape recording with me. And it sort of developed from there. So the, the, your interest in birds seems to suddenly come from recording them, or I mean, was were you interested in wildlife before then? Yeah, we had a bird table, so I was, I was, and you know, I was fascinated, and I had my observer's book of birds, and from being, you know, nine, ten, eleven, so I was interested in what I saw, and I was interested then with those days uh, of natural history programs, um, and and that that sense of being out and as soon as I could go out on my own. I used, to, I used to go out with my parents. They used to drag me out walking in Derbyshire. I did with my kids. Um, and so I had, a, I had an interest in wildlife and natural history and it came through television, which it also came principally from putting food out on this bird table, that, as many people do, and seeing things closer up and then having a tape recorder and wanting to hear them close up. So the two developed in tandem. I mean, as a young teenager, so I was interested in technology and music as well. And so that, that having a tape recorder helped me with that. That's interesting you talk about that, actually, um, music, because you are a founding member of two experimental <laughs> groups. One's called Cabaret Volatire, and the other one's yeah, called yeah. The, uh, the, is it the, Haff, the Haffler oh, Trio. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that's a long time ago, David. That's Maggie, by the way, my wife. Um, Maggie, how are you doing? Oh, by the way, everyone, um, just to let you know that um, this is being recorded. So if you are wanted by the police, now is the time to turn your camera off or to object. Otherwise, we're carrying on if that's all right. Okay, well, I'm clean. <laughs> but nobody saw me do it anyway. Um, so, yeah, alongside this, this tape recorder, my interest in recording outside, I actually found a book or was given or bought a book, I can't remember what it was called, called Composing with Tape Recorders by someone called Terence Dwyer. This would be in the late 1960s or possibly 1970. And um, I was fascinated by this because it, it then introduced me to using the, the tape recorder more creatively, using it as, a, as an instrument, as a compositional tool, rather than just for documenting. So I learned about this aspect of cut and splice and playing tapes at different speed and revealing these other worlds through the manipulation of this pre-computer tape, the manipulation of audio. And then I discovered, well, it was probably on, on Radio 3 or, or whatever it was called then, the music of a French composer called Pierre Schaffer who, who devised this, this style and genre of music called music concrete, which was creating music from found sound and, and he famously made a piece of music called the Etude of Chemin de Fer railway study and it was the sounds of a rail, railway station in Paris but cut and spliced um, into a piece of music and that for me as a teenager was liberating the fact that grown up people on Radio 3 were creating music like this and I became fascinated by that and then latterly electronic music and like everybody in the teens you know male and female wanted to to be in a band so that's what we did that's interesting because um i remember when i was a teenager in the 70s i know i don't look that old but <laughs> where did you grow up where, where, where? where? in london okay okay in london. and you know, it's, it is a situation where, you know, you, you get interested in music and stuff. And I remember um, winning, I think I won a, a plastic um, sort of recorder, um, a tape recorder. And 
myself and a good friend, my best, my best friend at the time, we, we decided to form a group and we called ourselves Unrehearsed. And at the time that the music was electronic, uh, we decided that we wanted to be batterionic because we had, um, I had an organ, a toy organ that belonged to my younger baby sister. Um, and when you pressed on too many keys, it kind of made a, uh, made a, a noise. Nice. There's, a band like, there's a band called XTC, which in, yeah, yeah, I remember back, them, yeah. Yeah, in, in those days used to play very kind of rapid, but interesting and also seemingly kind of, kind of really odd uh, electronic music. And we thought we'd replicate that, but using batteries. And a, and a recorder and an acoustic gu guitar and there's just two of us and we couldn't play any of them. Um, but what was interesting was that I remember talking to my friend and thinking, why don't we record, you know, record the guitar and recorder and then record something separate and then put them all together. And then that was the thinking Brilliant. that I mean, we, didn't, we didn't realize that the Beatles had done it 10, 15 years prior to us. But it's interesting how that develops, really. So tell us about the groups, the Cabaret Voltaire and the Hafla Trio. What, what, what was, what was that was, about? There were, there were three of us, and we, we'd all grown up together, and we'd gone to some of the, we'd gone to college together. And we were interested. We were in Sheffield, uh, and, and we were interested in all sorts of things that teenagers are interested in, music, art, film. And it was a uh, music for three working class lads was a very good way of, ex an immediate way of expressing ourselves. You know, we, we, we tried a bit of filmmaking with Super 8 and 16 millimeter film. Um, you know, we could write things, but it was very difficult to get things published and get it out there. And we were seeing and hearing all sorts of interesting sounds and music coming from the States and from the rest of Europe. And we just wanted to be part of that. That's the simple explanation for it. And so we started making music and it was the same time that, oh, just after punk really. And there was a record label called Rough Trade, London based label. Yeah. And, um, and Jeff Travis took us up um, onto, onto Rough Trade. And so we were, we were the second record on Rough Trade after Django Reinhardt. Um, <laughs> And it was it was just a great time. This was the late seventies, early eighties, and then because of we were in Sheffield, there was um, a label in Manchester called Factory Records that we yeah. started up, and we used to go over. Because we would go over for the weekend because there was a famous club night that Factory had, a place called the Hacienda. Well, it became the Hacienda. But in fact, it was a West Indian social club in Royce Road in Hume. And we would go over there and we had these fantastic nights eating great curry and drinking red stripe. It was just just the greatest nights and the great atmosphere and of course a great sound system. And then Factory started putting bands on there. Um, Tony Wilson, Alan Erasmus and, and we were invited to go and play there. And there was a, another band called Joy Division at the time who... I think I've heard of them. Sorry? I think I've heard of Joy Division. And, and lots of people came out of that orchestral maneuvers in the dark. The Buscox played there. Uh, there was a poet. Um, and we would alternate on Friday nights and, and it just evolved, you know, again. And, and we, we sort of migrated towards factory because culturally um, we were much closer to them than Rough Trade was in, in, in London. It was, a, it was a five hour road trip to go to London. It was 90 minutes to Manchester. And so we, we made a couple of records with Factory and we did a, um, a couple of short tours of Joy Division. We went to an amazing place in Brussels called the Plan K Sugar Beet Factory um, and played there in a few places over in, in Europe, in Amsterdam, uh, in The Hague and in parts of Germany. And it, it went really well, it was great. It was really good times. And then it all started to go wrong, of course. Um, slowly and under some terrible things that Ian died from, and, um, and then they got it's a very long story I didn't know I was going to get into this um, we the the new sort of joy division new order got a gig on on top of the pops one of their records and they invited us down and we went down and we'd also been recording uh, with a band called soft cell who had a, a number one hit um, with Tainted Love, and we were there, all there in the studio, and they, I looked around, 
And I thought, this is the last thing I want to do. You know, just can prostitute all my values just to come and do this, to jump around and sort of with that sort of atmosphere. And it had all gone wrong from our initial ambitions, like you said, starting out. We were keen to do something interesting and and learn in the process and be involved in in all sorts of cultural exchanges. And in music, you, what you need to do is is turn your revolt into style. There's a very famous book by George Melly, the, uh, the critic and, and jazz musician, called Revolt into Style, about in the music industry, all you need to have is one good idea and you then spend the rest of your life peddling it. And that's that's how you achieve success in that industry. And I very quickly fell out of love with that and became much more interested in what I was hearing outside than, than the music that we were creating inside. And what exactly were you actually doing in the bands? I mean, uh, were you... I was playing keyboards, tape recorder and synthesizer and, uh, and all that, you know, it was all... Sort of, yeah, there were, there were three of us. We didn't have a drummer, we used electronic percussion. Um, and, and so that's what we did, you know, and it was okay. I mean, we made about 15 albums and, you know, still get royalties today. And if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be doing this now. You know, I've, I've still got what I think is a very strong connection with music. Uh, I was still on on the label Touch with Mike Hardy and John Rosencroft. I work a lot with musicians. I've got four tracks on Bjork's latest album, Utopia, four recordings that she asked me for, for from Iceland. So I still, I'm still very interested in that crossover of sound and music, particularly with, with what we do, being involved in the natural world. So I'm convinced, I've had the luxury and privilege of, of traveling the world, mostly with the, with the BBC Natural History Unit, but from what I've seen of cultures around the world, from the Arctic to Tasmania, um, I'm convinced that all our music, all our music from all our cultures has evolved from people listening to the sounds of the natural world, yeah. birds, animals, and, and perhaps mimicking it. Certainly our language, I'm convinced, developed from bird song. There's, there's some really interesting work about um, people in North Eastern India, um, where our language might first have evolved from by mimicking birds and bird song. It's fascinating. It's a very powerful connection in that sense. And I think we all feel it. You know, we're, we're, it's, um, it's innate within us all, that sense. I remember when we did Life of Mammals with David Attenborough, we went to visit this people, Dogon people, in the very north of Mali, further out than Timbuktu. And they, um, the mothers had the baby strapped to the, to the backs with these very elaborately printed cloths, and they were pounding millet and maize. And um, I was talking to David afterwards, very interested in, in um, ethnic music. He was saying, you know, the first rhythms that Dogon babies experience is that pestle of mortar rhythm. Uh, and it's reflected in in music in Mali, you know that, and it's it's still it's transcended all the, those times and generations. So it's yeah. part of us. Do you think that you know, for example, in the natural history world, we are, or in the world, should I say, as humans, we are not in touch with nature by and large. Did you see music um, and I suppose art and culture as being an integral part of who we are? Because yeah, I mean, how, in how interesting now that we're reconnecting with it, you know, in these dreadful times of isolation, we're doing this. But so many people, you know, like we've had this conversation, I'm sure they said it to you, is, you know, they're saying, David, are the birds singing louder? Because all of a sudden I'm noticing bird song. You know, we're starting to reconnect. Some of that's been improved by the by we've had so much noise taken away. There's no air traffic over Newcastle now. There's very little traffic noise. So I've made some stellar recordings in my back garden the last two weeks. But very quickly, people start to absorb it and, and take it as significant. Because I think in recent generations, of course, we've, we've lost the importance of sound. It used to be 
vitally important to us. It was a matter of life and death. And the only time that happens now in the lives that we lead is you need to listen when you cross the road. When 40,000 years ago, when all of us will be living in caves in Lascaux or New Mexico or somewhere in Asia, Africa or in Australia, and we were all asleep in our commune at night, and a pack of spotted hyenas or a saber-toothed tiger came into that cave. We, basically, and generalizing, of course, we are the people that have evolved from those that woke up and escaped out of the back of the cave because the hearing was so acute. Those people that didn't wake up haven't evolved to be around and join in this conversation today. It was, it was crucially important. It was a matter of life and death, whether we heard or not. We don't have earlids, so even when we're asleep, we're, we're listening, we're tuned in. So, but I think because we live in such noise polluted environments, we've had to tune that out, and so it's become less important to us. Do you think after, well, hopefully when all this is done, do you think that we will retain the beginnings of this reconnection? Because obviously, as you said earlier, a lot of people are, I mean, I've been contacted by not only friends and family, but also by the media saying, oh, there's loads of birds everywhere. Um, do you think that people will retain that? Or do you think that we'll be lost as soon as the first airport opens up again? And <laughs> I know, it's depressing, isn't it? I'd like to think so, like you. I really like to think so. And, and I think there'll be some residual memory of it. But I think, unfortunately, we'll just feel compelled to go back to our old ways. You know, we'll want to get on a plane and... Um, will get involved in, in the buzz and hum of the 21st century life. You know, I'd like to think that um, you know, some of us will keep it in mind. Uh, and it may have some effect, but I I'm, I'm suspect it'll be residual. It'll just, you know, I don't want to sound depressing about it, but I'd, I'd be surprised if it has a long-term effect. I mean, hopefully, it might, it may, the, the best long-term effect is we may fly less, uh, which will certainly Excuse me, be some improvement. Yeah, I mean, uh, our track record as a species isn't great and we don't seem to have a very long memory. But anyway, going back to the fact that there's lots of birds to be heard now, why do you think that is? Is it because, as you said earlier, there's less traffic and therefore we're hearing the birds that be around us? Or is there another reason on top of that as well? Yeah, I think, I think that's one of the main reasons. And the fact we're all at home most of us you know we're all we're in one particular place and so we we tend to naturally explore our environments but i've been doing some experiments in my back garden i have to say well i live in newcastle upon tyne and we've got a you know decent sized suburban back garden mature garden bit of a wilderness at the bottom end because i i'm usually away so often that myself and maggie don't get into the garden that much but anyway um I started to record what was in the garden. We've had this stunning blackbird that's been singing from the top of a 10 meter cypress tree for the last two or three weeks. And I thought, well, I'll try all the techniques that are used in the rainforest or in the Arctic or in the tiger forest to see how, how close I can get a microphone to it. Because I spent a few days rigging a microphone up there. And when the microphone was up there, before the bird started singing, so four o'clock in the morning, 4.30 now, after the clocks have, have moved. Um, I suddenly realised with this microphone in the apple tree, I could, could not only hear this blackbird closely in the garden, but I could hear all the other resident blackbirds in the area. Now, I've done this before, and normally those ambient background sounds are smeared in traffic noise or um, holiday aircraft noise fr from Newcastle Airport. We live not far from the airport. So there's a layer of ambient noise which normally covers that up. And all of a sudden, I'm aware when I'm listening in headphones, it's a fantastic technique because I'm still in bed. Uh, so I've got a long cable back into the upstairs, in, into the bedroom. So I'm laid there trying not to wake Maggie up listening. And I can hear this blackbird singing right down the barrel of the microphone. But in the gaps, and of course we must remember that birds listen more than they sing, it's listening to what's happening. And now I think our blackbird, I say our blackbird, the blackbird in our garden, 
can suddenly hear all its rival male blackbirds sing around. And to anthropomorphize, I think it's thinking, wow, what's happened? You know, I've got all these rivals and, and some of them are better than, than, than I am. And so I think that's one reason why they're singing more vociferously, more vigorously, is because they have realized that they're actually under pressure. And of course, all the female blackbirds, the hen blackbirds, they can hear what's happening as well. So they're under, they've got a much better opportunity to spread their genes and fly around the area and mate with several other blackbirds. They must be laughing, the females. <laughs> I'm convinced. I mean, well, they're, they're, that, that's why they're such successful animals, birds, in that respect. They very quickly take advantage of, of niches like that. And I'm, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's one reason why people are saying bird songs really loud. Um, apart from the fact there's less noise, the birds can hear each other. There's more competition, so they're more vigorous. It's interesting you said that because the other morning I went up on my sun terrace. I'm in Spain, next to Madrid, in, in the nice. you know, city called Merida, under lockdown for the last 39 days. That's kind of story. <laughs> but I went on to my, because um, I, I left my phone out overnight because I wanted to record nocturnal sounds. And when I got upstairs and it was still kind of dark and there was just loads of blackbirds singing. I mean, it was like, about 15 different blackbirds singing and it's like a massive orchestra of blackbirds mm. which i would never heard before mm. and I didn't really think about it until you just mentioned it today I just thought well maybe that was it because you can hear everything because it's complete silence normally yeah. Um, now, yeah, yeah. as to in the past but can we hear your blackbird yeah no I've got it I've got it here I've got about 30 seconds of it this is what I did I use a uh, uh, I made an ambient recording, but then I used a gun microphone and I fixed it on a pole in the top of an old apple tree. So this is about four meters away from this singing male blackbird at 4.30 a.m. So this is about as good, <laughs> as good as it gets. And it's a mono recording, so there's no background. I, I can't hear that. Does it sound okay? Sounds amazing. I mean, yeah. it's one of the best sounds, certainly in Britain. And to me... Well, that's, um, that's, the, that's the other thing. Um, again, I'm sure you've had this, David. People, you know, all you have to do to hear that is put your head out of the bedroom window, really. You know, you don't have to go to Costa Rica or the Amazon or wherever to hear some of the most amazing um bird song you just this time of year at these latitudes you know 50 55 degrees north i think you've got the the best dawn chorus in the world yes of course yeah. that's that's a solo the dawn chorus consists of a series of solos but it's now's a good time to listen yeah. to your own recording yeah i mean i'd like to talk to you about the actual act of recording in a minute um, and obviously, if there's any questions, by the way, at any point, please um, let us know, guys, if you want to ask anything. But when we were talking earlier, uh, Chris and I, um, you were telling me about temporal resolution. Um, can you explain what that is? Because it sounds absolutely fascinating. Okay, well, I, this comes from a range of sources. Uh, bearing in mind, I'm not a scientist, but when you work on natural history programs, I mean, you're much more of an expert than I am, but you work on natural history programs. If uh, I'm working on um, Life of Mammals with David Attenborough, and we go to film Asian tigers in, in um, or uh, Asian lions, Asiatic lions in Gujarat or somewhere like that, let's say, we're quite likely to have with us as a scientific advisor, the world's authority on Asiatic lions. 
So, because the research is so good. I mean, you know what it's like. And so you, you, it, that rubs off and you tend to become a sort of barroom two minute expert when you go home on Asiatic lions. Everybody says, wow, wow, wow. Because you can reel off these half a dozen facts about Asiatic lions, which some persons, he or she has spent 30 years of their life researching. So I absorbed some of these things. And one of them was, it actually came from sea mammals, from Orca originally, a guy called Vincent Yannick from Aberdeen, who described this whereby he said some animals we can live alongside. And he actually, to simplify it from my point of view, use birds. And he said, we can see and hear them. But he said, if you listen to some bird song, and the blackbird is not a good example, but I've got a good example I can play. Um, we could hear it, but we described some of the notes as trills or blurs of notes. Um, and he said, that's how they sound to us. But he thinks, and other scientists are thinking, that it doesn't sound like that to other birds. They can resolve each individual note and derive information from it. That blackbird this morning when it was singing from the top of that cypress tree was it wasn't doing it for a laugh it was doing it to to assert its territory to to compete with rival males it was doing it to attract the sexual attentions of a female so it was pu putting out lots of information which we you know uh, give it a sort of music assert to it musically but in fact it's like these packets of information and um I started slowing some bird song down, and it's astonishingly revealing when you slow this down, these blur of notes, particularly with the wren, which, which I can play it, you start to be able to resolve the individual notes. And Vincent was saying he thinks, or some of the scientific community think, that other birds, other animals can resolve it. So another blackbird doesn't hear it in the same way that it does as we do. It can actually resolve the information which is too fast for our ears and brains to, uh, to resolve. So because that's a time-based thing, it's called temporal resolution. So they're, they're living alongside us. We can see them, we can hear them. Like the serin I heard singing from your apartment when we FaceTimed this morning. But another serin can resolve that information very accurately. And to them, it's not a blur of notes. It's like a packet of information. Shall I play the wren? Is that my yeah, that'd be great to describe it more eloquently than I can. So this is the song of a wren. This is the straight foot and recorded in my garden a couple of days ago. Eight seconds of song. Okay, did you hear that? Right. In those eight seconds, there are 64 separate notes. Now, we couldn't count that, but if you slow it down, you can start to count, first of all, the elements of the phrases and then the individual notes. This is the same piece of song slowed down on a, an old-fashioned way on a tape recorder at half the speed. So it doubles the length of the song phrase. It reduces the pitch by an octave, but it stretches out the information so we can start to hear the component parts of it. That's completely different. Yeah. So that we start then to get into this world, the, the mind's ear of a wren. Then you slow it down once more, and we start to then pull out the individual details. This doubles the length again, but I'll just play it. This is the same song slowed down uh, to a quarter of the original speed. incredible and that that course then everybody says well that sounds tropical 
Well, that's because, you know, birds in the tropics have evolved to sing at a lower pitch because lower frequencies cut through the dense foliage of tropical rainforest. It's funny you should say that, actually, because the wren, as a family of birds, I mean, there's, I think, 200-something species of wren, they are actually from America and South America, with the majority of species actually found in the tropics in South America. And the wren that we have in the UK and Europe is the only representative of the family in the world outside of, the, of, of Americas. So maybe, oh, that. maybe that's what you're saying. Maybe it was originally a tropical bird that's now moved you know, into other parts of the world that has retained, you know, the tropical elements of its uh, voc vocalism. Yeah, well, it's certainly, um, it certainly evolves. I've been to St Kilda, I don't know if you've been out there, you know, yeah. St Kilda wren. I don't know if that's a separate species. or something. Species. But that was, it's identified as such because of its, the song phrases are different. And I've been to the Pribilof Islands as well in the Bering Straits in between Alaska and Russia. And there's a species of wren there, which has a very, it's superficially looks similar, but that has a different song phrasing, same pattern, but, but, but different, um, different phrases. Fantastic. How did you make the transition from, from being in bands and music to sound recording on you know, natural history programs? I, I saw it, I still see it the same part of the same thing actually I was I mean I was I, I was interested as a teenager watching natural history films or all sorts of programs I mean mo most of them David's and um, and I was appalled as I am now at the soundtracks these dreadful ghastly orchestral Hans Zimmer or Berlin Philharmonic orchestral soundtracks over natural history programs and that, that was one reason I thought, well, because I was interested in film sound anyway, film music, and Cabaret Voltaire did a couple of film soundtracks. So I was interested in that process, the bespoke process of creating a soundtrack for an image. And I thought, I must be able, and I was in, much more interested then in going out recording wildlife as a, an antidote to the studio at weekends, because I was on the edge of Derbyshire. Uh, I'd bought through the band and through the studio more and more sophisticated recording equipment, microphones, so I'd take them outside and record skylarks and ringoozle and birds um, in the Peak District. And slowly, in any case, became more interested, I think, as I said earlier, what we were, what I was recording outside than what we were creating in the studio. It seemed much more magical to me. And I thought, well, I wonder if we could try this in film and television because the soundtracks are so bad you can't hear the natural world you just hear um, some impressionistic music of it and so that's what prompted me to move into film and television um, and it was a slow process I, started, I came up here actually to Tyne Tees television in Newcastle upon Tyne because uh, uh, Channel 4 had just started and they had a commission for a music program here called The Tube with Jules Holland and Paula Yates. The Tube, by the way, it was my first ever TV appearance. Oh, really? God, yeah. when was that? Um, I was on the Tube um, in, 90, uh, God, it must be 1981 or something. And it was about the soul music um, sort of uh, thing that's sweeping the nation, going to clubs and stuff. And I belonged to a, a group of people, we called ourselves the Paddington Soul Partners. And we were scooped up. And I remember being interviewed by um, Paula Yates and I was before the interview thinking, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say that and say this. And then when the microphone came to me, I just went, <laughs> <laughs> I was completely jammed up. Wow. So, yeah, the tube. I was still working on the tube. And I said, how amazing, how amazing. Anyway, yeah, so it, that was great because we were, I got involved in, in working service and I was put on this program because I knew a lot of the producers. And it was great because they'd say, I'd be in the canteen. And I was a trainee, so they'd say, and in those days, film crews were larger, and so they'd, they'd be, in a, as well as a camera person, there was an assistant camera person, and the town recorders had an assistant. I've never had an assistant in the last 20 years, but the sound recorders then would have an assistant, and that's how you learn, you would go out, and, and the head of the department would say, oh, Chris, next, next week you're going out to Jamaica for the Sunsplash Festival and you're going to be talking to Rita Marley and Black Uhuru, and you're going to meet King Tubby, 
uh, and I just, you know, and, and so I would take my recording equipment and I, went, I remember going out in King, around Kingston in the botanical gardens with my tape recorder and the, um, and one of the park keepers with a massive spliff walking around the botanical gardens just pointing out the birds and the plants and I made some amazing recordings. Yeah, so that got me and started travelling. Yeah. Oh, Lee Perry. We spent a, a whole day with Lee Perry, both in NASA at Compass Point, but also in his Black Ark studio in the Blue Mountains, which he'd set fire to and burnt down because he believed it had been infiltrated by evil spirits. And so Chris Blackwell at the time, this is, I'm going off on a tangent here, but I just remember this. Chris Blackwell owned a record label called Island Records. Island, yeah. And he lived in Jamaica. He lived up in the Blue Mountains. And Black, the Black Ark studio, Lee Perry studio, was at the bottom. And um, when he burnt it down, when Lee Perry burnt it down, it got some strange spirits in it, he believed. Chris Blackwell said, come to NASA and finish your album at Compass Point, which was this amazing state-of-the-art studio uh, in the Bahamas. And so we went out there and hung out with Lee Perry for a few days as he was making his album. But he's always had this sort of power trip. So every time I've seen him or when we're working with him, he would carry batteries in his pockets because he believed he could absorb the energy from, from batteries. And when he was on Love Beach um, on NASA, he'd walk out, he would only record at night. On, on, during the day, he'd walk down the beach and all the stones, you know, really, the rocks on the beach, the stones got really hot. So he'd pick them up, and because they'd absorbed power from the sun, he believed he could draw upon this power making his album. So he took them back to the studio. And the artists at Compass Point had small artist apartments, like with a you know, kitchenette, diner, and a bedroom. And um, so when Lee was in his apartment, the stones started to go cold. So he put them in the oven, in the electric oven in the apartment and whacked it up to maximum to keep these stones hot. And after about three days, there was this massive explosion in his apartment and all these rocks shattered. And it took his apartment out. If he'd have been in there, I'm sure he wouldn't have survived. And anyway, after that, Chris Blackwell <laughs> sent him back <laughs> to Jamaica to blow the apartment up. It's funny. Okay, listen. Um We've got to a point where we can actually uh, have some questions, and I believe that uh, Hillary um, would like to ask a question or two or three. Hi, Hillary. So I've been Hi. rambling on. Sorry thank about you. that. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. You, you, you've had a fascinating uh, life in recording, I can tell. Um, I, I joined this um, group today mainly because I'm working on a on a sound project, but I'm by no means an expert. I'm trying to run to catch up on the uh, recording side. Uh, my previous experience is mainly in bird watching, um, but I've got involved in a sound project. So um, I would like to ask you a few technical questions if other people uh, are, are happy with that. Um, yeah, sure, that's, that's one of the reasons we're here. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, now, uh, just uh, obviously you use a big parabolic dish I notice you have a, a, a sort of cover over it and you've already referred to um, a gun microphone. Um, can you tell us a bit about parabolic dishes and covers and microphones? And mm. if you refer to a, a, a mono recording so you could pick up one bird. Um, and obviously I presume if you're doing, uh, trying to do a dawn chorus you would use stereo or or even multiple microphones so can you just tell us a bit more about all that please yeah well microphones come in all shapes and sizes in fact this is one of my favorite microphones the one i'm using here which is a small mono microphone and it's called a personal microphone that's because it's designed to go on people but i can tell you they work really well in places excuse me, such as song posts. I was recording a white-tailed bumblebee in the back garden yesterday with one of those on a, a little stick following it around. So this is omnidirectional, which means it picks up sound from all around. So no matter where I speak into this microphone, it will sound the same. 
directional microphones, gun microphones that I was talking about, are much more focused and they need to be pointed at the source. And they're very good outside. Gun microphones don't work outside. For natural history recording, my microphone of choice would be an omnidirectional microphone and I'll get it as close as possible to the source of the sound. All the other instruments try to reduce the distance or the ambient background. A parabolic reflector is a very special instrument. It's been around decades. I've seen pictures of an American ornithologist called Miles North using one for Cornell University in the 1930s. And that has a very special shape, a parabolic shape, parabolic curve. X equals Y squared is the, is the shape of it. And if you put the microphone at the central point of a parabolic reflector, any sound that hits the dish, in fact, just hang on 30 seconds, I'll go and get mine. I could, it'd be more yes, practical. <laughs> so, Hilary. Um, Hi. Well, Hi, David. How are you? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We know. Um, um, what projects are you working on? Uh, this is um, a project to uh, record bird sound in Rwanda, in Africa, where I have particular interest. I've uh, been working for years now promoting bird uh, watching and bird guiding and bird ornithology in, in Rwanda, and I've been a few times. And uh, the, the sound, the bird sound of Rwanda okay, is I not recorded. And you, for bird, birders will appreciate that the sounds made by birds vary by species across their range. So if you look on like Zeno Canto for a recording for a particular bird in that region, it's probably been recorded in Kenya or Tanzania or somewhere else, certainly not in Rwanda. I think about only 120 examples from Rwanda and none of them are terribly good. So the objective is to record the entire Rwandan list in Rwanda and get the Rwandans doing it as a citizen science project, but also as an ornithology project. So it's, there's two angles to it, the sort of technical experts and they get the citizen science going as well. But it has to be a random project because it's a big project. 703 species will take a few years to get through. So I'm involved in this project. I'm more on the logistical side. Um, others are more on the technical sound side, but I'm trying to catch up with the sound recording so I understand the project a bit better. So that's why I'm asking questions and I'm a bit basic on this, but I'm catching up fairly fast. So I'd like to hear about equipment. That's a fantastic project you're working on. Yeah, it sounds good. So Great. I'll continue with this. Right, thank you. Yes, that, oh, that so looks really is, interesting. If you want to, from what the brief, I came in very late on your description, but it sounds to me that this instrument will be ideal for that project of getting people to record because it's quite a challenge to get micro individual microphones close it requires a lot of field craft and, and experience relatively that's why i enjoyed getting a microphone close to the blackbird in our back garden because i knew how i would do it basically but if i was starting out this is a really useful instrument it gives this is a parabolic reflector and it gives you acoustic amplification which means you don't there's no electronics evolved in amplifying no. the sound. Parabolic curve, and at the focal point, which is the point um, yeah. in, in this case, in, in, pl in the plane of the dish, the focal point, any sound that hits, hits this reflector parallel to the axis, imagine the main axis is here, any sound that hits the dish anywhere on the surface parallel to the main axis yeah. will be reflected back to a common point. Yes. Focal point. So right. here, 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 here. Reflector back. So it, it gives you acoustic amplification, which is. And, carry on. Yes, sorry. I, uh, and so for that, you would use an omnidirectional microphone positioned at that focal point, I presume. I would, yes, yeah. Some people for bioacoustic research choose a cardioid microphone. And the microphone is. A, points into the dish because the, all the sound you record comes off the surface of the dish. Yeah, I appreciate it's cardioid, that. Cardioid, which means heart-shaped, directional microphone, points into the dish and picks up all the reflected sound. 
the disadvantage of using a cardioid microphone well the advantage first of all is you get a super clean sound because the dead side of the microphone is pointing out of the dish so you only pick up reflected sound the downside of it is cardioid microphones are very sensitive to handling noise so unless this is on a tripod all the arthritic creaks and any (laughs) movement that you make all the the rustles and creaks and groans will be picked up yeah so i tend not and and for uh, on xeno canto a lot of those people bioacousticians will use a cardioid microphone because they want a super clean sound and they'll accept some handling noise i prefer to use an omnidirectional microphone uh, for two reasons first of all you get all the reflected sound but you also get some of the ambience the atmosphere yeah. Not much. Yeah. Yeah. you get some from some, this side. Yeah. but the main yeah. advantage of an omnidirectional microphone is there's no handling noise omnidirectional yeah. microphones are much less sensitive to handling noise or wind noise mm. than i actually microphones. like some of the background noise because you very often pick up other birds yeah and give it yeah. some context and habitat context and as long as it's not too much uh we in rwanda we have a particular problem because there's always children there yeah uh yeah. but uh yeah i mean that's a, a that's a side issue but um i i in recordings it's always interesting to try and figure out what else you're hearing at the same time yeah well certainly if you're hand holding a reflector I would always recommend an omnidirectional microphone. Okay. And the great yep. thing is you can get these tiny capsules so you have a very lightweight system. You know, so people yes. are encouraged to do it. Um, and you just need to fix it at the focal point. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, and um, oh, Sorry, can I interject for a second, um, Hilary? Uh, sure. I've got um, may I make a suggestion. Maybe at the end of this seminar, perhaps you can hang on uh, if you don't mind, Chris, and maybe you can ask more questions one-on-one to uh, to Chris. Would that work for you, Hilary? Because I just want to make sure that, you know... Well, I'm, I'm, I certainly don't want to hog this. Yeah, I'll keep quiet. Let's get you two together after this meeting. You can have a little chat in more okay. detail. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, thank yeah, you. Happy to do yeah. That, yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, anyone else uh, with any questions? I mean, I, um, I've, I've got some notes here from Charlie here who said he's recently bought a nice cheap parabolic dish and microphone set up from eBay, cost around 60 quid. The recording device is not included. And he's given a, a uh, website. Charlie, are you, uh, do you want to talk about your recording experiences? Can I fish you out? I can't hear anything. Charlie? Okay, we can't reach Charlie at the moment. Um, I just wanted to sort of carry on with this whole situation with your career, Chris. Um, one question that kind of I think about is what does what does sound actually mean to you? You know, how do you how do you see sound? Because it's like when you work on radio, people say radio is a visual medium and for those people who don't understand that they'll be thinking what does that mean so what does sound mean to you yeah well the cliche in the bbc you know is that people say radio is better than television because the pictures are better because it, it fires your imagination in a unique way and that that's what it does to me i mean i've always it's always been part of my life and it's a part of all our lives it, it is i think as i said earlier it's it's less vital to us now but nevertheless it's i just enjoy it so much sound and music i just revel in it and i i love the experience of recording but also listening to my work and to other people's and to music so it's a very powerful medium in that sense and it's um, i think it's visceral as well it's sound strikes directly into our hearts and imaginations in, in quite a, a unique way there's, there seems to be this sort of direct connection. It needs, um, one thing I've learned, with particularly my installations, like you said, I'm very interested in spatial sound, and they're quite often sort of natural subjects that, um, that I present. But the, the effect that, that it has on people is very powerful. 
So I present my work in the dark and, um, and providing people are comfortable and don't feel challenged by that, then we can really get into a you know, great experience of listening. And I, I love that. I love being part of that. I li also like this idea of when I'm out on location, um, most of the time, it's a unique experience. When you put headphones on, only you can hear the world in that way. You cannot share it. Um, and it's very hard to describe. We don't have the vocabulary of sound. We say things like you said earlier, let's see what that sounds like. Um, so we don't have the terms for it. What I enjoy, any, for, any form of presentation, so this, making a radio program, presenting my work in an installation, doing a workshop in front of people, really like enjoy, and enjoy broadcasting my work in the widest sense. So recordings like that one that I made, listening on headphones early one morning, being able to broadcast it, play it to people, and share that experience is very valuable to me. How, how good is your hearing? <laughs> I'll resist the temptation to say pardon. <laughs> I, buy, um, I mean, it's okay. I mean, I'm 66. You know, I've got age, I'm sure I've had age-related hearing loss, like, like all of us. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'm very careful now. Um, I don't expose my ears to, I'll try not to, to loud sounds or music. I'm careful to try and look after it. I have my hearing tested every year and I get my ear strings. I mean, flying's no good for your hearing, certainly. I always wear headphones when I was flying a lot and don't plug them in. You know, I use, uh, I try and reduce my exposure to long-term loud sounds, which can be quite damaging. So I think it's okay. You know, I can still hear Goldcrest. I, I remember years ago being out with Bill Oddie, making a program with him, and there was a Goldcrest singing, and I pointed it out, and you could hardly hear it. Now, for those who don't know, a Goldcrest is a tiny... Sorry, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a tiny, because there might be some people here that um, are unfamiliar. It's a, oh, of course, I've got a book in front of me, but it's a tiny, uh, in fact, this is Europe's smallest bird, and they make a very high pitched sound, um, which I'm thankful I can still hear, but I always, do, you know, take the mickey out of people that can't hear it, <laughs> which is it's pretty cool. with, with grasshoppers, and I did, I did a project last summer with some kids around the Olympic Park in London, and they were picking up grasshoppers which I couldn't hear. So that's the uh, Goldcrest, beautiful little bird. And I got sound on this as well, actually. Um, obviously not as... Uh... Yeah, yeah. But to hear that in the field, some people just can't hear that. And similarly, the call. It's right at the very edge of... Uh, uh, hearing cap capabilities and crickets, yes, yeah, so the Roselle's bush cricket, um, which sounds like a buzzing of an electrical pylon. I hear it all the time when I go to Wormwood Scrubs in West London, but I'm with people and they just can't hear anything, mm. which is, is quite incredible. Tell us more about Mr. Attenborough. What's he like? Because I've heard he's amazing. To work with. What's he? I'm sure a lot of people are kind of quite interested in that. What's 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 he like to work with? It's exactly what you imagine. It's, it's just wonderful, beautiful human being. Yeah, it's a real incredible pleasure and privilege to work with him. It has been since the last I don't know, 25 years I've been working with him. Ever since the life of birds in 1995, I think that's when I started working with him. So what's that? 20, yeah, yeah, 25 years. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. He's the best ever traveling companion conversationalist um, continually informed it's it's quite challenging being with him you have to be aware of what's happening around the world and what's happening in natural history because he just is an avid reader of you know, everything and he soaks it up remarkably and has this incredible recall of knowledge and information and conversation so it's um, and he's a great sound ally that's what I like about him. He started, I would like to say, 
which is true in a way he started off as a sound recordist in television but he, he never quite made it he was never good enough <laughs> so he had to find another outlet for his talents which he seemed to do okay with yeah. i did a talk with him at the british library a few years ago and he because he had the foresight even in the 1950s um when he started with zoo quest he realized the importance of recording sound on location as well as taking pictures so he's a great advocate of that he's not a great fan of music in natural history films but that a lot of that is beyond his control so he understood from a very early from the very first days of wildlife filmmaking that you needed good location sound and in fact he took some of the very first location recording instruments as far as i know ever out to places like guiana um and to africa when he was recording and of course he took a parabolic reflector but he took one uh, a grampian reflector which is made from spun aluminium which has a bit of a metallic ring to it and he recorded with a, a tiny reel-to-reel tape recorder an emi midget and his, his recordings are still in the british library national sound archive so you can go and listen to them from the 1950s he, he made a recording of howler monkeys in Belize uh, in about 1955, which is probably the first time anybody made a sound recording of them. Um, and so it was, yeah, it was really a cutting edge of it. Um, and then he, obviously, you know, his, his career is historic since then. But yeah, it's a real pleasure, privilege to, to be with him. I was working, I've been working with him this year. I was in, um, where were we, in Costa Rica, and then we went to Finland in February working on a series with him called Green Planet, which is um, a sort of remake of um, Life of Plants, which he did in the 1970s. I think we've got a couple more trips for that. But, um, Finland was the last time I was with him. It was minus 20. And we're in Finland in this frozen forest in February. And we were out all day and we did amazingly well doing pieces to camera. Incredible. Okay, well, I think we're kind of drawing to the end of this fantastic um, session on in conservation with um, are there any final questions before I kind of uh, do a bit to do some wrapping so to speak yeah I don't seem to have spoke I don't seem to have met everybody else I spoke to Hillary but I can see all the other names on the top yeah anyone else want to ask any burning questions before we uh, we go Alan um, one second, Alan. Yeah, I just wondered, Chris, uh, with these recordings, particularly listening to the, the rain, there's obviously absolutely masses of information in that song that we could hear. And I just wonder if there are any plans by I know, ornithologists, academics, to actually sort of analyse that and see what, it, see what it means, see what it's actually saying. Yeah, uh, well, it's, the, 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 the theory, and mm -hmm. that's what it is about temporal resolution, is still quite new. And so there are people I know, well, certainly Vincent Aberdeen University is interested in it because he's studying sea mammals and he believes that higher sea mammals like orca and bottlenose dolphin may, may have very fast temporal resolution. The fact that they can, any animal that can use echolocation and we believe can, because we don't know, but something we believe can create a very high resolution image in sound something that in computer terms would take a massive amount of processing. Um, so they must be able to resolve that information, you know, in a fraction of a second, a bit like radio. Mm. It just is beyond our understanding communication like that. Um, yeah. And it's the, it's the same with insects as well. Insects that use ultra, or work in ultrasonic frequencies with the stridulation as well, because it's still, it's still conveying information. Mm. I think it's fascinating. If Vincent described it, I thought very really eloquently to me, as just as a layman saying, imagine sending an old-fashioned fax. So you were sending bursts of information from which you could create a, a picture. Mm. Perhaps we need to think of it, temporal resolution, as absorbing information in a different way. You know, the way we're speaking now through um, our various laborious language speaking and having to understand it 
temporal resolution speeds that up by an, an enormous factor. Um, and so I think it's the way in which the information is assimilated, which, which is interesting. And that's what some people are working on. The, uh, Sandra Vierenkamp at Cornell is doing a similar thing as well. Mm. Uh, but there's still, it's still just theories at the moment. There's no uh, hard evidence, but it's interesting to to demonstrate it with things like the REM song. You could, yeah, you could, it's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. Pleasure. Anyone else for any questions at all? No? Okay, well, I guess it leads me to finish up in the now traditional way. And I'm explaining how this tradition has come about. Basically, I used to watch this program called In the Actors Studio, where this guy was interviewing all these greats like Rob De Niro and Jodie Foster and stuff in front of a studio audience of uh, students, film students, and then ask the usual questions about work and how you do stuff and things. But at the end, he'd ask two off the wall questions, which were, um, which were basically, Charlie, do you want to ask a question? Can you speak? Yeah, I can hear your microphone, your headphones. Uh, sorry, sorry. I, uh, yeah. Are you going to ask a question? Maybe not. Oh, sorry, my, my, my headset's a bit broken, so um, some other time. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, he used to ask these questions, and, and the, the question he'd ask is, what's your favourite curse word, and what would you say when you get to the early gates? And, you know, to... Mm -hmm. But my version is much more to me. Chris, what's your favourite bird? A golden plover, without a doubt. A bird that will be singing now in the North Pennines and the Northumberland Moors. And it's just, the, it has the sound and spirit of the place, that sound of wilderness. And, you know, you know, David, you can, you hear these birds before you see them, particularly with the display flight. And that, you're, you're amazed how they can hang in the air and they have that plaintive two-note song. And what, what is your favourite fish? Oh, fish? Cod. Not for the obvious reason. <laughs> but I worked on a project for The Guardian last year about noise pollution in the oceans and learnt about fish sounds and how cod, um, the males, are very territorial. But in the fact of fertilisation, when the male and female do this parallel swimming, they have this amazing, remarkable dance. And the females really release the eggs and the males release the milt into the water. And at that point, when they're doing this parallel swimming, they purr rather like cats. So there's this incredible series of vibrations passes between the two fish. Wow. So I, I have the greatest respect for cod. Um, it sort of changed my whole attitude towards them without hearing about that. Fantastic. What's your favourite invertebrate? Um, at the moment, it's a, a white-tailed bumblebee because I've been recording them in my back garden. And in fact, one woke me up this morning at six o'clock. Maggie jumped out of bed because I had some cables going through our bedroom window. The window was fairly wide open. And we heard this, you know what bumblebees are like, you heard this huge sound approaching the window. Maggie jumped up because she thought it was going to fly inside the, the bedroom. So it woke us up. So I've been following them around with this little microphone. Great sound. Wow. Uh, what's your favourite mammal? Orcas, without a doubt, about because they, I've just got the greatest respect for them. What's your favourite plant? Budlia, because we've got some in the garden, uh, and um, that you can class that as a plant. Yeah, um, yeah, cause it's just what what comes in in terms of invertebrates and butterflies and beetles and birds. Yeah, it's just a great colour as well later in the summer. And finally, if you could be anywhere, obviously notwithstanding this pandemic, but if you could be anywhere this very second, where on earth would you be now? Kielder Forest, Northumberland, without a shadow of a doubt. Somewhere where I can get to without getting into an aeroplane. <laughs> and, um, and just be there because I, can, I know the space is there. It's one of the few places where you can get away from people, even before this pandemic and traffic noise. And at this time of year, just about now, or within an hour, will be the most stunning evening. <laughs> Fantastic. 
Well, I'd like to, uh, before I say goodbye, or we say goodbye to Chris, um, I just want to say that uh, as a continuation of this series of In Conservation with tomorrow, I'm speaking with um, an eminent ornithologist from the US called Ken Kaufman, um, who famously as a kid, a teenager, traveled from coast to coast with no money and wrote about the birds he saw and his book has become seminal. So that's one guy. Um, we're also looking to speak with Jason Ward on Friday. He's another fellow American, Afro-American actually. He lives in Atlanta. He's become known as the US's urban birder because he's really keen to engage with people in his, um, his uh, community to get them involved. And he's really gone great strength. He's got a really successful um, YouTube channel um, watched by thousands um, talking about urban birding. So that's great to talk to him. On Sunday, so on Saturday, we got um, some, some uh, British people. We have a couple called Ruth and Alan, uh, Ruth Miller and Alan Davis, who um, famously um, in, I think, 2008, decided to travel the world to try and see as many species as possible of bird wow. and broke the record. And they became known as the biggest twitch. And they are, you know, very well known within the UK. So they're going to come and talk um, on Saturday. And on Sunday, we have another uh, US person, a guy called Drew Lannan, who is another Afro-American. And his whole thing is about colouring the conservation conversation. So we'll be talking about his mission on Sunday. So if you'd like to join in any of those, just go to the website. Um, some are free, some are just a fiver, um, so please feel free. So without further ado, and if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank Chris so much for your time. It's been fascinating. We could have spoken for at least three hours about stuff. I mean, we haven't even covered some of the stuff that we, you know, <laughs> talked about earlier. So thank you very much for, for your time. And um, please come again, guys, and I will, let's call me meeting off now, and the Hillary stay behind. It's like... Detention, is it, Hillary? You're staying behind, <laughs> Hillary. Um, but thank you very much, guys. And no, we'll just cover again. I'm just Chris. Out with a few seconds of Keel the Forest because I yeah, want to know as well. Yeah, the titles, cue titles. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Chris. Really appreciate your time. You're amazing. Thank you very much. Guys, we'll meet again. Thanks for being involved in, in conservation with. See you guys.